So let me acknowledge a number of contributors on the project. This is it's probably eight or nine years old now. Um, I started the project years ago with James Field and Kulraj Singh, and I work mostly now with Christy Ugerslev to manage the project. Uh, but a lot of folks have contributed to the project over the years, including uh, Fred Oswald, has been a big help us here today. I actually use Mike Chung's medicine software in the system, and if Wolfgang Vicko uh, were here right now, I'd point to him and say at some point I would be using his publication bias analyses uh, in the software too. Um, I should also acknowledge funding from a number of sources, uh, sources including the National Science Foundation, the Sherman Foundation, the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, and a group called CCAP. So here's an outline. Um, I understand there's about 45 minutes for my presentation, and then hopefully 15 minutes or so for discussion. So I want to start by talking about kind of the problem and why Metabus exists. I'm going to show you some under the hood kind of specifics about how Metabus works. I'm going to talk briefly about the project history, but I really want to spend a lot of time giving you live demonstrations because this is essentially a platform that is free for you to use, and so I like to um, know that folks know how to use it. I watch on the back end and I can see kind of the queries that are run. There's probably a privacy issue in Europe about with that. Um, but I want, I want you to know how to run queries, so I'm actually going to show you how that works. Um, and then I'm going to show you some sample insights. So these are basically some new research findings. Uh, that are about to be sent off for publication that we're kind of excited about. Uh, and then we'll talk about um, future directions. So, usually when I introduce Metabus, I talk about this thing I call the crockpot problem. Um, and you're probably to some degree familiar with it, even though you might not be, sh be aware that you are. But when we go on Amazon.com or any large internet retail site, um, we find things that we're interested in very, very rapidly. And if I were interested in searching for information on crock pots, um, even such a mundane item, I could probably figure out exactly how long it would take to get to my home. I could probably pick one out in the color I like, four or six quarts with a timer or without. And I'd know exactly how much it costs and everything else. And if you notice on the left side of the screen here, we have what looks like a taxonomy, right? So we have um, Crock pots are nested under slow cookers, which are nested under small appliances, which are nested under kitchen and dining, and I'm not even sure what the next category above that is. But the fact is that the use of this taxonomy allows us to very easily navigate the universe of products that they have on Amazon. Right. This is how we find scientific information. So in many ways, when you think about it, scientific information takes a backseat to crock pots. Um, and this example is a meta-analysis from 2001, the text you see on the left, published by Tim Judge and his colleagues. And they were looking for correlations on the relation between job satisfaction and job performance. And if you notice that section I've highlighted, they said we manually searched the 21 journals in which most of the satisfaction and correlations appeared from 1983 to the present. And I sat down one day and said, I want to try to estimate how many articles they can search through to try to find these job satisfaction, job performance correlations. And I'm making the assumption that all of these journals go all the way back to uh, 1983. So that's probably not a safe assumption. We'll go with it for a second. If that's the case, we have 21 journals over 17 years, so 357 volumes. Assume that you have an average of five issues per volume. That's 1,785 issues. And assume that there's six articles, which is probably conservative, per issue, we're talking over 10,000 articles that were potential for doctoral students, right? Over 10,000 articles that were probably hand-searched to locate these correlations. It's a monument to the deficiency, when you think of it. So in many ways, for those of you who have conducted a meta-analysis, you might have felt like this at some point or another. Um, and that's I've done it, so I know what it's like. So some folks might say, well, why not just rely on electronic search? We have, we have electronic search, we can just go to our EBSCO or whatever it is, and we can type in what we're interested in and find everything we need. Well, the problem is that text searches are not perfect. And as an example, the letter string H, A-G-E, exists in 955 words in the English language. And that gets a little tricky when you're in the field of management, which contains the three letters H. Um, uh, also, these searches tend to miss findings, and there's a number of reasons why. Um, if we go back to the day before PDFs were text-based, in other words, when they were image-based, you know, sometimes you download a PDF that it takes a little longer to download and the quality is a little lower, those are image-based PDF files. What that means is you can't search that full text until the OCR has been applied to it. There's actually quite a backlog of that information. 
or of those PDF files. The point is that electronic storage is not perfectly reliable. Okay. So how can we make things better? Um, and this is what I thought about back in uh, 2010 or so, and I said what we need is a system whereby we can extract every research finding out of papers that have been published and, and apply some kind of a standards-based indexing protocol sort of procedure. And then build an interface where people can come and search for these findings and ideally um, kind of summarize them. So, I don't know if you folks have seen uh, the alien show in the History Channel, but every time I think, imagine, could you imagine this? I always think of this guy. But could you imagine if you had all of the findings in the field, in your field, in one database, and it were curated in such a way that facilitated search, such as by using a taxonomic coding scheme like Amazon uses, you should be able to conduct instant meta-analyses, at least rudimentary instant meta-analyses, on virtually any topic you like. So that was kind of the starting point. And so I sat down and scratched my head and I said, well, let's, let's think about this. Let's think about what do our research findings actually look like? Now, I'll admit that I sometimes feel like I'm cheating because I'm in the area of applied psychology. I suspect there's many of you in the audience who are from experimental or other types of traditions in psychology. Um, but the reason I feel like I've, I've been cheating is that in applied psych, we almost exclusively report our findings in correlation matrices, which is a very highly efficient way of summarizing effect size information. All right. So I thought to myself, here we have in applied psychology these thousands and thousands of correlation matrices, which together contain millions and millions of effect sizes due to the form of zero order correlations. Right? What can we do to extract this information, and what should we be extracting? And that's kind of what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to show you some examples. So here, I want to make this point about the um, about kind of the percentage of findings that I think are missing from view and open. This is a prototypical. Um, abstract from the Journal of Applied Psychology. What I've done is I've underlined in red, it's probably hard to see, but I've underlined in red um, the constructs that are mentioned in this abstract. And I've taken some liberty here because it seems as though they've kind of mentioned some of them twice using different words. But we have self-reported detachment, we have life satisfaction, emotional exhaustion, task performance, which they also call job performance, uh, and proactive behavior. So those are five constructs that we have mentioned in this abstract. Right? So if you think to yourself, what's the maximum information that could be contained in this article? This is what should be, this is what you should be picturing. We have those five constructs. We have a correlation matrix, which gives us the correlation between any construct and any other construct that was mentioned in the abstract. Sound about right? Everybody with me? You have your alpha values or whatever other reliabilities might be on the diagonal, and in this case you have the mean and the standard deviation for each construct. Now I'm going to show you the matrix that actually was in that article. What you see in green is what was what I just had on the screen a moment ago. What you see in red is stuff that you, know, you wouldn't have any ideas in, is in that paper just by reading the abstract. So that just goes to show you the power of the correlation matrix. And it contains tons and tons of information. And every single one of those correlations is a perfectly viable candidate for inclusion in a meta-analysis. There's no rule that says it has to have been the central topic of study that we mentioned in the abstract for you to use it in a meta-analysis. So again, this is kind of the opportunity we realized, and we said, wow, there's tons and tons of fine stuff in that for a while. Um, I'm just going to go through very quickly, but um, folks have been talking about building archives of findings. And in this case, it's for systematic review data. Folks have even been talking about building what they call living systematic reviews, so that as new findings are published and added to the existing system, why why start from scratch, right? And there's even platforms that have been built. This one is at Stanford University um, that allow you, I think, through the magic of our uh, shiny, uh, to upload your meta-analysis for data and let other people interact with it and so Some really interesting things going on. Um, so that's kind of the logic. That's why we decided to do what we're doing. So let me jump into Metabus now, and I'll tell you kind of how we, how we manage this process. Uh, we start by semi-automating the correlation, uh, the extraction of the information in the correlation matrices. Then, and I want to make sure this is clear, we manually code every variable that we extract from those papers. So this is not a fully automated, unattended approach. Okay. Um, and then, of course, we build uh, platforms for search and discovery and so on. I know this doesn't look very pretty, but what you see on the left, I think, is the same matrix I showed you before, 
And what you see on the right is kind of a representation of the database structure. You'll notice that it has sort of two sections, right? We have a top section, which represents the variable level information, right? In this case, we have every variable listed, and we have what I'll show you later is a taxonomic five digit code. And then down below, we have the effect level. So for those of you who are into databases, you can imagine this in SQL as having two different tables, right? Effect, effect table and, uh, and variable table. And if you notice the way it's structured, the first two variables on the top on the left can be brought down to the next level in terms of pairs, right? So we have whatever that is, 12 or 13 variables on the top left, and you can imagine what's in this bottom right is every possible combination of all those pairs, all those variables. Make sense, everybody with me? Okay. And here's another example. We've just moved down one, and now we have the next pair. Okay. Um, I probably don't have enough time to talk about every single database field, but you might be wondering, so we coded this stuff manually. What is coded manually? So this is the information we have, and this is a table. I know you can't see it, but if you go to a human resource management review paper that we published recently, this contains a schema of our database, and it tells you the name of every field and all the values that it can take. So this is a nice, neat summary of the entire database. So what we know for every row of the database at the variable level, okay, not at the effect size level, because that gets automatically migrated by pairs. At the variable level, we have the following information. The mean, the standard deviation, uh, I'm sorry, the verbatim variable name was reported in the paper. The sample size, whether that sample size was exactly that sample size. Long story, ask me if you're curious. Um, the taxonomic code, which I'll talk about in a minute, whether or not it's conceptually reversed, whether or not its reliability is alpha if it's present, the reliability value, the time point, the response rate. We code for um, participant type with two codes, the source and the pertains to. So for those of you in IO psychology, the prototypical employee performance evaluation, the source of that information is the supervisor, the pertains to is the subordinate. Okay, so we have two codes to handle that sort of thing. Uh, we have the unit of analysis, so we collect information at the individual level, the group level, the team level, the organizational level, whatever level you like. Uh, the country of origin, and we also have an indicator for the confidence uh, with which uh, the coder coded the article. Okay, so I'm actually going to stop there for a moment and ask if anybody has any questions so far, because then I'm going to jump into all my demonstrations. Does anybody have any questions so far about the platform? So you get the basic idea of the structure. We have variables, we have effect sizes, and we have all this manually coded information. Okay. All right, so I'm only going to show you very, very briefly the coding sheet. This is just to give you an idea of how it actually works from the end user, from, I guess, the coder perspective. So, let me see this right. So on the right, we have here a correlation matrix that has been dumped in from a PDF extraction software. And everything you see to the left is the codes that are put in. And wherever you see a red cell, what it's telling the coder is that you must enter something here. So for example, uh, if we wanted to say what was the source and pertain of, these, of this row of data, I might say the source was managers and it pertains to uh, general employees or it pertains to students or whatever. So most of our codes are input like that. And so this way we don't have very many mistakes because it's, you can't put in invalid data. So if I were to type in a student, it should know that. So you can't put that there. So it's all validated from the front. And like I said, I don't want to spend a lot of time going through this. I just wanted to show you that's kind of how our interface looks like. Okay, so let me tell you about the taxonomy. Um, one of the biggest problems we have in our field is, I think, what uh, human-computer interaction folks call the vocabulary problem. And the idea is, um, some people call it, it's not exactly the same, but some people refer to it as the jingle jangle problem. The issue, essentially, is that we have many different terms that all mean the same thing. So imagine you have this huge database with all of the verbatim, the verbatim variable names that were reported in the original article. And you said, I was interested in, let's say, job satisfaction and job performance. So you go into your database and you type in your query and you say, I want to see job satisfaction and job performance in your data. And you get almost no results. Any idea why? It's because job performance goes by hundreds of names. It might be car accidents or number of errors or typing speed or who, who, supervisor's rating. There are so many different terms that are used as verbatim variable names, but there has to be some way to organize them and classify them, or your search is going to be ultimately ineffective. Or you're going to spend the next decade coming up with all the possible search terms that have ever been used. So our way around that is we built a taxonomy that contains essentially all the variables we study. 
So I actually would like to play a game real quick. I'll try to stump them out. So I'll ask someone in this room who's familiar with IO psychology or applied psychology, I guess even personality psychology, to name a relatively popular construct that you would expect to find in an IO psychology journal. Not a topic per se, not like employee selection, because you wouldn't expect to see that in the matrix, but the actual construct that you would expect to see in the correlation matrix. Not all at once. Now there's a section, there's a segment on IO psychology later today, so there has to be at least one IO psychologist. Yes. Turnover attention. Okay, turnover attention. Maybe one more. We'll do that one. Maybe one more. Self-efficacy. Self-efficacy. Okay. So this is a little embarrassing, but I've been doing this for a while, so I can tell you this, the code for turnover attention is 20179. <laughs> so I just now normally went that. Well, forget that. Okay, I'm just going to type in turnover. I just typed in the word turnover into the search box on the top right, and what it's done is it's limited the taxonomy to tell me this is where you want to look for things for getting the turnover. So it's highlighted the intentions box down here. Let me get this out of the way. So we're going to go to intentions, employment intentions, quit intentions, uh, turnover intentions. It's really the same thing as a quit intention. So the, now uh, 20179 is our code for quit intentions. Basically, it's a meaningless five-digit number, a unique identifier that allows us to input that into the search. And again, the whole point here is to get around the issue of using exact letter strings. Now, um, I'll remember that one, but let's look up self-efficacy, right? Okay. So for us, self-efficacy is a person characteristic that's psychological in nature, and we have it under both traits and states. So there must be a state self-efficacy and a trait self-efficacy. So this is a good example where the search should actually, I would actually prefer to use a letter string search in this case. So what I'm gonna show you, and this is the, the first function I wanna show you, is how we go about specifying the query. So somebody mentioned turnover intention. In our case, I'm gonna use the, the, um, the five digit taxonomic code 20179. So I've specified one construct to be searched for. Self-efficacy, is that right, Fred? Let's see that. Okay. Maybe my I'm not going to put, the reason I'm not going to put a hyphen is because a space within the text query is interpreted as uh, an and. So if you were to type job space status, it would capture job satisfaction as well as satisfaction with job. So I guess it, with or without the hyphen shouldn't matter in theory. Um, but let's run this now. When I click run query, what's happening now is we're going to the database, which is at Amazon Web Services, and we're saying find everything that matches this query structure or the, these query specifications and then run an instant meta-analysis on it. So it came back with 45 effect sizes, and this is, by the way, relying on a meta set in the background, and if you're curious, you can actually see, this is what you would see if you were in R. Uh, that came out of meta set. Uh, did I do anything wrong, Mike? Did I specify it correctly? No, actually, that was it. I'll ask you later. Uh, 45 effect sizes were found, uh, 33 independent samples from 31 articles. The sum of the independent sample sizes was just over 11,000, and our mean R was a negative 0.057. Both of our confidence interval values have the negative signs in front of them, so I'd say that's um, um, a slightly negative relationship. I'm not sure if that's what I would have expected or not. I don't know if anybody has a theory. What you can also see, um, is all of the information that I mentioned before, the mean, the standard deviation, response rate, and what have you. If you move to the right, you'll see all that information. But we also have it all linked by DOI. So let's say you were on campus and you said, ah, here's turnover intention and self-efficacy, a paper from 1997, the correlation was negative 0.1, the sample size was 178. Let me see what article that was. And you can click on it, and through the magic of the DOI, it'll bring you eventually to the article's homepage. And usually, if you're on campus, one more button click will get you the PDF article. Obviously, we can't post it, uh, otherwise we'd be violating some populations. Okay, so what else am I trying to check out all this stuff I want to tell you about? Oh, let me tell you something else about making a taxonomic search. You can also mix and match text and taxonomic code. So 2017 is what we use for turnover intention. But let's say I want to use text as well. I could type in turnover, but if I type in and that will give me behavior in turn number two. But just for the point of um, demonstration, I'll show you that that does actually work. We'll probably have more than 45 effect sizes now, but we're mixing behaviors and intention. But just so you can see that it works, there it is, 52 effect sizes now. Um, 
let's imagine for some reason you didn't want anything with the word managerial in your results. You could come up here and precede a string with a minus sign. And I'm just going to use the string manager. Now we're going to have fewer than 52 effects, and it's going to remove that row of data that was managerial, so that we can see. So that's how the query um, specification works. You can use the five-digit codes from the taxonomy, or you can use the letter strings, and you can you put a, 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 a minus sign in front of anything you're basically specifying as an exclusion. Okay. okay so that's it. All right, let me show you the filters. And this is really just fun. This is all built in R shiny. This is all just kind of fun we've been having with this stuff. Let's imagine, uh, we have data here from 1993 to 2014. Let's imagine you want to see everything from 2003 to present. You can slide that slider um, across your fingers, and it'll re-estimate it for you. And now we're only looking at data from 2003 to 2014. It doesn't seem to have impacted our effect very much. I think it was a negative 0.06 in the last, the last term. You can do the same thing with the correlation value or the sample size or the individual versus other unit of analysis. Um, let me start over and run a larger query because I want to show you something else that's kind of fun. So I'm going to do job satisfaction with um, performance because we get a lot of findings for that pair and I want to get a large, large database in memory here. <clears throat> for those of you who know the literature, I think Judge all reported about a 0.18 on this relation in 2001. I get a 0.173. That's close enough for me. Uh, but what I wanted to show you here was that I can go to this thing that I built recently called Run Additional Analyses. It's only rudimentary at the, at the moment. It's a basic regression. But using everything that was in the database that you can imagine, I can say, well, let's see, I want to predict absolute effect size from, I don't know, how about variable one, which was job satisfaction, that's reliability value. And let's say I'm also interested in, in uh, the response rate, I'll type that into it. So what we've just done is a meta-regression, it's a rudimentary meta-regression, where we're using the research characteristics, in this case the reliability value and the response rate, to predict the absolutized effect size. Um, in this case, it looks like neither of them are having an impact on our, on our effect size. Um, and it even checks for reception. This is technically not specified correctly, I'm still working on it, but just to give you an idea of the sort of things that we're building. Um, something else that's fun that we can do through the magic of our we can build a map uh, of the world. Because we have the country of origin for the data collection for every row of data, I can say, show me a map where these data came from. So I can tell you that 575 of those, 864 effects came from the US, well, one from Russia, um, and you can kind of click and play around. 18 came from Germany, if you're curious. Um, so that's that. You can also, I built this function called share results. So you can basically decide that you have, you have created this query that you want to share with people. You've removed a few rows of data and everything else, and you can click share, and then you'll get a unique link, and you can send that to someone. And they can, they can look at your results. And they don't even have to have a MetaBus account to look at it. They can just click on it in their email, and they can see the results. So if you're ever reviewing a paper and you think somebody's you know, taking some liberties they shouldn't as they're building a hypothesis, and you don't think this is really universally positive related to that, you can, you can run a quick query and send it. You can say, check it out. Um, I've never done that before. Ah, okay, but the most exciting thing, I think, anyhow, is something we recently built called exploratory meta-analysis. Uh, this is actually the first time I've demonstrated this, so I'm kind of curious to hear what you all think about it. Um, but you know we have this big taxonomy that can, and all of our variables are classified according to it. So what we can do now is instead of specifying two search terms as we did in the last, uh, in the last example, we can specify only one search term and then run all possible meta-analyses against that one search term and create a map of basically everything that this thing is related to. So show me all the relations all the meta-analytic relations with gender, or show me all the meta-analytic relations with job satisfaction. So keeping with turnover intention, and by the way, it really works with the taxonomic codes, you can't do this with text. So if I'm gonna type in, um, let's do let's do turnover intention, because that's what we started with. I know it's a little hard to see, sorry about that. This column here, or this drop down, it tells you um, the minimum K to be set up. So it's basically saying, don't show me any bubbles, or don't show me any meta-analytic estimates unless they have at least 50 effects. And try not to go, if you use this, do not put that too low to start this, you could crash the circuit. Um, now what we have here, 
and I'm absolutizing the, the correlations. You can use either absolutized or raw R's, and we're scaling the node size by K effects. So basically, the size of the bubble tells you K. That's how frequently it's studied. And the color of the bubble tells you absolutized and then meta-analyzed R. So as I'm just looking at this plot, like I said, I know it's hard to see. You see red over here for turnover intention. That's opposite. Other measures of turnover intention are very strongly related to turnover intention, no surprise. We see relations with stress. There's, um, with the absolutized R, it's about a 0.3. Burnout, motion, exhaustion, we see relatively strong relations there with turnover intention. Um, what else do we, oh, job search behavior. I guess that's no big surprise if you intend to quit. Probably searching for a job. Uh, what else is there? I can't see. Oh, we have some, some correlations that are relatively strong with job satisfaction, organizational commitment, which are basically the same thing anyhow. Um, but anyway, that's essentially how it works. And in fact, I was demonstrating this once, and someone asked me for gender. So this is, I think I can remember, the tool, it's 20457. Let's see if you know it's in there. What is it? My doctoral student over here, he would probably tell me. And actually, this is an interesting case, because we, we have two codes for gender. One where male is greater than female, and one where female is greater than male. Um, and eventually, we'll normalize it. But if, I want, if I'm going to do absolutized effects, two or four, five, eight. If I'm going to do absolutized effects, I'm just going to use the parent node. So let's see, two or four, five, eight. Oh, I should I, I, I made a mistake I warned you about. Sorry. Effects. It's going to try to write it twice now. So, okay. So this was an interesting finding. If, if for those of you in IO psychology, you're probably familiar with the thing called the glass ceiling, right? Where essentially females uh, progress through organizations or advance through organizations at different rates compared to males. Well, if anybody has good eyes, can you tell me where you see the strongest effects here? And again, the color represents. The effect size, the size of the bubble represents the frequency of study. So you should see a red thing kind of jumping out at you in there somewhere. You probably see it, it's salad, right? So just a quick exploratory meta-analysis on gender as related to anything tells us that it's relatively strongly related to salary, but it's not relatively strongly related to things like employee performance. So it's kind of interesting. So that's the kind of fun you can have with exploratory medit. Sometimes I get bored on the weekend and I'll just sit there and kind of exploratory medit. <laughs> you can do the same thing. Oops. Okay. All right, so that's exploratory medit. Okay. I still have 12 minutes, right? Okay. okay, that's enough demonstration. So now what I'd like to talk about um, is a recent uh, project that's just about to be sent off for publication. In fact, Fred Oswald is a contributor on it. And I want to give you um, kind of an idea of the sorts of research questions. I mean, of course, playing with the interface is fun. But let me give you some examples of the sorts of research questions we can ask with this database on the back end. Um, so this is a paper that we love to call the monster. Um, and it basically uh, tries to summarize all sorts of the, the variable level codes in all different kinds of ways. So again, I know this table's hard to see. But here's, uh, if you look at that first row, it says all constructs slash variables. So I'm including all taxonomic codes, not just behaviors, not just attitudes, but everything, right? Overall, here's a research question. What's the median sample size across all of these different studies? Uh, and this is, by the way, a summary of 195,000 variables. Mean sample size is 209, 209. Has that changed over time? Yes, the unstandardized slope is 2.91, which means from 1980 to 2016, uh, we're increasing at the rate of 2.91 observations per year. All right. What about coefficient alpha? Here's a summary of 78,675 coefficient alphas. If the mean is a 0.82, the standard deviation is a 0.89, it increases at the rate of 0.16. Uh, that's actually multiplied by 100, so it increases at the rate of 0.016 per year. What about response rate? You can ask the same question. It's probably less interesting. Um, if you look a little further down, what I can do is I can summarize these by variable type. So I can ask questions like, what's the average sample size for behaviors versus intentions versus psychological traits? Um, what I think is probably the most interesting here is actually how our field has changed over time in terms of the frequency of study of these different things. So don't forget, this is in the area of applied psychology, right? So within applied psychology, the frequency of measurement of behavior 
And by the way, across all years, is 17.3% of our variables are behaviors. But they've been decreasing at the rate of a half of a, about a half of a percentage point per year, and that's driven mostly, ironically, by the measurement of performance. So basically, we're studying employee performance less frequently over time as IO psychologists. What's it being replaced by? Any guesses? Psychological traits. Psychological traits have been on the rise at about 0.3 uh, percentage points per year. Uh, and well, overall, it's like 12.89 percent of our total uh, our total database. But when you look at just the last 10 years, you see a totally different story. What else do we have that's interesting? I can also split up all the data by country of origin, and I can ask questions like that. I can ask questions like, do most of our data come from the U.S. or from elsewhere? And this was actually, I think, the most surprising immediately for me. Um, what I'm highlighting right now is the amount that, this is the M49 standards, by the way, so I know it's called North America, but Northern America for the M49 standards is U.S. and Canada. 60% um, of the samples from across the entire database from 1980 to 2016 came from Northern America. If you split that up for, for the first six years and the last six years of the database, 1980 to 1985 versus 2010 to 2015, in the early years, 88% of our data came from Northern America. In the last six years of the database, 47%. So less than half of the data now comes from the U.S. and Canada. Where is it coming from now? Well, you might be interested to know that Germany has increased from 3%, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Europe has increased from 3% to 30%, a tenfold increase over that time. But that was kind of a shocker to me. Um, this is another analysis that I'm really giving a kick out of. Um, we're running dominance analysis, which are kind of like relative weights analyses, where we can ask questions like, what best predicts an exercise? So again, we have hundreds of thousands of correlations in this database, right? We have all these different methodological attributes, such as the sample type, the country of origin, et cetera. To what extent do those different methodological attributes explain variance in excess? One of our questions. Most of that variance is explained by the alpha value, which I guess when I guess give friction credit to select the right thing to correct for in psychometric metaphysics. So 63%, and this is by the way of the explainable variance, and it wasn't very much, it was only like 1.6% in the case of effect sizes, but of that 1.6%, 63% of it is the alpha value, explains uh, how big the effect size is. These are also done on absolutized effects. And then the journal H index is the next most important factor, then the publication year. And then if you look at things like whether it's student data or non-student data, not very much, but it's something that influence it. Whether it's US data or from somewhere else, 1% of the 1.6 uh, percent of the variance, almost nothing. And sample size, which you'd expect not to be related to effect size, is in fact not related to effect size. We can ask the same exact question of the alpha value itself. So what explains alpha values? And this was kind of a shocker too. The publication year explains almost all the variance. And by the way, we can explain more variance in alpha. I think it was around four and a half percent. So we explain over three times more variance, or about three times more variance in alpha than we do in effect size. And most of that variance is explained by the publication year. Over time, the alphas have gotten stronger and stronger. And then there's some other dust that if you want to look at the slides, you can look at the slides. And this is another interesting question. This is. Um, for those of you interested in psychometric, uh, psychometric meta-analysis, you might know about corrections for attenuation, or corrections for unreliability, right? The assumption, especially when you're correcting for unreliability, the predictor and the criteria, is that they are unrelated. In other words, there should be a zero correlation between the reliability of the predictor and the reliability of the criterion. Otherwise, you're overcorrecting your effect size. Well, here we go. We have a million rows of data Many of those rows have alpha values for each of the variables. So what we take a look and ask, to what extent are those two values related? So I split up the database by variable types. So I split it up by attitudes and it's specific attitudes, intentions, behaviors, et cetera, et cetera. On the diagonal, we have relations between variables of the same type. So for instance, an attitude to attitude relation might be job satisfaction or commitment. Uh, you can imagine a, 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 a trait, trait relation might be extroversion to conscientiousness, what have you. In no case did we find a negative relationship. Every single one of them was positively correlated. I think only two of them, and they were small samples by the way, only two of them were non-significant. And they range from somewhere, if you forget about the non-significant ones for a minute. Uh, well, the omnibus R is a 279. 
but sometimes it's as strong as 0.5. So there's definitely a relationship between those reliabilities. And in fact, I'm not the first one to observe this, but it's uh, in this case, it's a much larger sample and a much finer grain analysis we're allowed to test. So. Okay, so um, I've got four minutes, so I'll tell you about kind of the last thing, I'm, or the next thing I'm excited about testing. Um, I, I have a major problem with, or what I think is a major problem in our team, is uh, construct redundancy. So I think what we call distinct constructs probably, in many cases, are not distinct constructs. I don't believe job satisfaction or commitment are different constructs. I just don't buy it. And I think that's true for many of our attitudes. So I, uh, my next kind of major project in using the database is to do a large-scale assessment of construct redundancy. And I've talked with a number of experts, and I still don't know how to do the analysis, uh, but, I'm, but I'm working on it. But this also is not a new question. Um, in fact, the example I just gave you, job satisfaction, job uh, satis uh, satisfaction or commitment, uh, we, Lee and Frank Schmidt and colleagues did a, a large-scale study on this, and they found that the construct level correlation between these two constructs, I don't know if you can see it, it's 0.91. That's close enough to unity for me uh, to say that they're not distinct constructs. And that was a relatively recent paper, but this has been talked about for a long time. This is a paper from 1983 where they were talking about work commitment not necessarily being distinct from other constructs. And more recently, uh, George Banks and his, con uh, uh, his colleagues have, have considered this issue in the role in the, uh, in the context of leadership. So there's a lot of really interesting things. Uh, but what I'm really excited about, I, sh I should have mentioned this earlier, I'm really excited about um, the Institute and the fact that the, um, the, the, the Germany supports an institution like this, to have an Institute of Psychology Information. We don't have anything like that in the U.S. In fact, I'm probably the closest thing to it in the U.S. Um, but I'm excited about that, and I'd be curious to see where curation goes in psychology outside of applied psychology. Now, like I said before, I feel like I'm cheating because I'm lucky. I have correlation matrices in my area of psychology. But in the area of experimental psych, where you're reporting ANOVAs and maybe a few layer squares or what have you, it's a very, very different situation. The coding is going to be much more cumbersome, and you're only going to get a handful of effect sizes out of each paper. And when the exercise is done, I don't know if you're going to be able to do what I just did on the screen. I don't know if you're going to be able to run an instant meta on 800 effects. I really don't. Maybe at the very, very broadest taxonomic level would that be possible. Um, but, I, but I'm not sure. It's not really my opinion. But I could imagine if you were to do something like I've done in that area, you would have to code all kinds of stuff, like whether the manipulation is within it between subjects. And if there's a manipulation, how many different levels? And if you have means of standard deviation for each level, you'd probably want to extract those too, so you could probably calculate your own d scores from them, stuff like that. But then you have to describe the nature of the interaction of each level. It would be much, much more cumbersome, but who knows, maybe you can get more richness out of it. German style, I think right on time. <laughs> How do you determine which concepts you include in Metaverse and which you don't? So I'm sorry, so which are included in, during the development of the taxonomy? Yeah. Um, that was an iterative process. It took two or three years to do. Um, we started by extracting uh, the variable names from the articles over, I don't know, two or three year periods. So we did start from 1980 and ended back then, it was probably 2010. And every couple of years, we grabbed a whole bunch of variable names and we started building the, building the structure of the taxonomy. Um, I don't think we're ever going to build one that's going to make everyone happy, even within the area of biopsychology, and it's always going to change. Or, or I should say, we've built it to be flexible. So the way the taxonomy um, structure is developed, it's a string. Right? You could imagine going from intentions to employment intentions to quit intentions. So you have three five-digit codes. On the back end, I can move this node from here to here, and it will automatically update the structure of the taxonomy, um, and also will influence uh, how the search is conducted. So I'm, I don't know if that made sense at all. 
But what I think what I'm trying to tell you is that it's very flexible. So in the future, if a new if a new concept comes out, we can pop it in there, and that's no problem. But yeah, you asked me the question. It wasn't easy, and and I worked with two doctoral students to create that, and we sometimes met for multiple hours twice a day, and we had to roll our sleeves a couple of times over arguments about you know is that a behavior or isn't it, or is that an attitude, or and some of those distinctions are really interesting both sides. Thank you. Sure. Had a very interesting talk, and you opened up a big barrel. Um, a little while ago, we had an interdisciplinary workshop uh, on, um, among computer scientists and psychologists, and we found that in order to improve this type of work, we need more standards in psychology, we need including more reporting standards, and those standards should be machine readable. Yeah, because when they are machine readable, this work that you're doing would be much easier. So this is basically a plea for all of us to improve standardization in psychology. Well, I, I couldn't agree with you more, um, and I'm not an expert on it, but I think that the PLOS family of journals does have probably the closest thing to a standardized reporting format. Anybody who knows PLOS, feel free to chime in. But I, I believe there has been an effort underway to extract correlation matrices and tables from PLOS 1 and the related journals because apparently it's a very standardized format. But, but to, your, to your credit, you're absolutely right. Um, and, and again, I'm just lucky to be in a field where we have a relatively standardized format. There's still some, there's still some quirky uh, 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 issues. So sometimes effects are above and below the diagonal. Sometimes things are in parentheses, which confuses itself because it thinks it's negative. Sometimes the decimal point is missing. You know, so there's all kinds of things you have to handle. Uh, I used the, uh, the metaphor the other night of a, of a plane. A plane can drive without a person, but, but you still need someone in the seat. You, you have to be there, there's always going to be something that comes up. Uh, you have had lots of kids, in the seat. Yes, yes. Uh, I hey, Frank. Great job. Are you going to give me an easy question? Well, I was wondering your thoughts about uh, using Metabus for community building. So because you have the superordinate taxonomy over massive research, right? Right now it's the quality, but you can imagine other disciplines. What are your thoughts about using that to connect people that are, it's not necessarily a genuine fallacy, but it's different communities approaching similar problems? Yeah, that's, um, that's a good question. Um, I suppose an early attempt, uh, uh, an early attempt at that could have been keywords, right, when you think about it. Um, or at least organizations might have used keywords for that purpose. Um, the tricky thing is that there's a, there's a difference in a topical area versus a construct name, right? So I, when I watch the queries that occur on, on the back end, so I sometimes see some queries that I think are silly. So someone will go in and type in employee selection. Employee selection doesn't exist anywhere in a correlation matrix. Uh, well, there might be a few special cases. But in general, employee selection is a topic that's an umbrella term that subsumes many bivariate relations, right? So cognitive ability to performance is a selection topic. Um, uh, ethnicity to uh, cognitive ability is a, is a performance or a, a selection topic. So I don't, I'm not really sure. I suppose one could specify the constructs they're interested in, um, and it could be used for some kind of a, a matching to determine their their similarity with other people's interests, but I'm not sure if some other level in between the person and the constructs would be needed to identify the topics. And topics are something we don't have, uh, well, I mean, we have things like personality notes, but we don't have anything like employee selection in, in the taxonomy. But that's an interesting, that's an interesting question. Yeah. This promise, I guess. I'll let someone else do it. I, I think it's fantastic what you what you created, um, and I was thinking about the literature. So the number of papers being published this year, I think, is growing exponentially. So I was wondering, how do you keep up with the new literature? We don't. <laughs> uh, not only is that you're right, and I used to know what the estimate was, um, but yeah, it's it's growing. It's just growing very quickly. But the biggest challenge at the start is dealing with the backlog. Right. So for some, I guess for applied psychology, there's about a hundred year backlog. Now we decided not to go back before 1980. And even Hades would have been strange. 
Uh, if I had done it again, I would have said nothing early, earlier than 1990. But um, I think the bigger task is completing the code of the backlog than it is keeping up with what's being published. Um, and I think enough momentum would be created and enough excitement in the community would, would be created by overcoming that backlog that it perhaps could be that one would not have a typical type of freedom people to, to, to help to maintain that. Yeah. That's a good question. Yeah. yeah. I think that question is in the same direction. Were you thinking of using crowdsourcing to code uh, the articles? So, do you think you could just yeah outsource that work to more or less non-experts? So, okay, yeah. So we've talked about this in our team. We've applied for grants for it without success. Um, one of our team members went to Minnesota to talk to the individual who. I forget the name of the individual. We did some big crowdsourcing project that had to do with planets and colors or stars or something like that. Um, and I think ultimately we decided that our tasks are a bit too complex to rely um, on crowdsourcing. I, I don't want to say I don't trust it in any way, shape, or form, but we have our coders go through a three-day intensive training uh, program uh, because they have to learn how to code things. So they have to know, for example, that response rate is number of invites, a uh, number of uh, uh, respondents divided by number of inmates. You know, they have to know the taxonomic map, which takes them, you know, weeks to, to become relatively familiar with. So I would be, I guess, a little less confident in anything that's coded by someone who hasn't been trained. The other challenge that pops up from that is, is the order in which the data are 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 collected. Right? So we typically we typically assign an issue or a volume to a coder, and then they complete that issue. And so we know how to manage the holes and what's been collected and what hasn't been collected. So if we allow crowdsourcers, and well, I guess in a crowdsourcing context, you could probably manage that somehow. But um, to answer your question, we don't use it yet. Um, if we were to use it, we would need a much more advanced coding platform that has to be what it is. And right now, we use a lot of Excel shortcuts that save time. I'm just wondering if, I guess if I had unlimited grant funds, I would build it. But I, I'm not sure if the return on investment is there at the moment. But that's a very good question. We, we, we've been struggling with this for years, um, but we seem to have had relatively good success just relying on trained coders. And plus, they're all, pretty much all PhD students, psychology, higher psychology students. So they tend to have a very high level of familiarity. Um, and that's not something you guarantee in the, in the crowd. But you could have multiple coders, right? The other issue, and I don't want to take too long on this way, but, but the other issue is that, as, I, I suppose we have to ask ourselves, is IO psychology or any area of psychology that interesting to people um, on the whole compared to things like uh, the plants and the stars? Uh, we, we see a lot of people responding, a lot of the, but, they're, but they're answering very, very simple questions, right? Like, what color is this star? Uh, I don't know if they get a lot of training for that. Now, I'd, I'd be happy to talk with you afterwards about it. We've thought about it and we just keep it in malls, but, but that is a good point, yeah. Thank you, Frank, once again.